Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Troy Moling and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. I hope everyone is having a wonderful July. Glad you could spend a little bit of your day with us. Starting off today's broadcast, and it's been hard not to notice muddy feedlots this year. And to make matters worse, conditions haven't really allowed producers to clean and maintain their feedlots as they'd like to do. And for the cattle, spending so much time in the mud can decrease their profitability. Studies show cattle standing in four to eight inches of mud can see a decrease in weight gain of nearly 15 percent. That number can go up to 25 percent if the mud gets up to their belly. It's just a nuisance and a hurdle for them to go about their daily activities. When they go from a resting area to a feeding area to a, a water spot, uh, it just takes a lot more effort to do that. And the result of that is they, they limit the number of times that they go to the feed bunk or go to water and uh, and also then they grow slowly and uh, and for the operator that means that they're going to have to spend more feed on those cattle to get them to the market weight and uh, it's going to be longer between that they have to grow them out. Rick also says a properly designed pen is necessary to keep the mud to a minimum. Is there concrete around the places that should have concrete? Uh, so it doesn't become muddy. So high traffic areas like the feed bunk, behind the feed bunk, around the waters. Uh, are there mounds properly located and, and maintained? Uh, and then also look at um, the slope and drainage. Uh, is that slope maintained and, and between uh, groups of cattle? And then is it tried to be maintained uh, if need be during the grow out? And then we could look at uh, at repairing um, after we clean, uh, are we repairing the, the holes that are naturally going to form? Uh, even with the best cleaning skills, uh, there are going to be holes that end up there. Are we repairing those so they don't collect water uh, right from the bat the next grow out? And finally, the uh, last thing to really look at would be uh, are there places where water is building up because uh, manure or, or soil has, has created a dam uh, during the grow out? and those are locations like at the back uh, fence line. Removing excess manure and bedding will also dry out a muddy lot faster. And if possible, experts say you may want to think about moving the cattle to a different area altogether. Next up, a wet 2019 could also be bad news for cattle producers needing hay to feed their animals. The extra rain has resulted in standing water, which damages forage stands, and delays cutting, giving the hay fewer nutrients. So if you're dealing with quality issues, quantity issues, or both, it's time to begin thinking about a plan. Nebraska Extension beef educator Aaron Berger says if you think your supply may be short, find a way to reduce the demand. And that could be something as simple as thinking about uh, early weaning calves, moving calves off the ranch, early pregnancy testing cows, identifying those cows that are not pregnant, uh, moving them early uh, to reduce the forage demand as we move into the fall and winter here. Uh, then the other option is if you're going to try to keep stocking rate or cow numbers the same, it's figuring out how do I either move the cattle to the feed or bring the feed to the cattle. Those are really the two options. And so in terms of bringing the cattle to the feed, uh, there is some prevent plant acres now that could be available to utilize for grazing or hay. Another thing is just to figure out what can I do to complement maybe what forage I have. And so looking at some limit feeding options. We've done quite a bit of research at the University of Nebraska looking at limit feeding cows. And so if I'm short on forage, uh, energy dense diet that utilizes maybe grain or something like ethanol co-products combined with some low quality hay, we can limit feed those cows in terms of we're meeting their nutrient requirements, but maybe not feeding them all they'd want to eat and we can use that as a tool to stretch resources as well. And the costs of buying more feed to supplement the hay can add up quickly. This is where proper budgeting comes in handy. If you're early weaning calves, obviously 
Maybe you backgrounded those calves in the past, sold them after the first of the year. I need to visit with your tax accountant, see what you can do from a management perspective there in terms of not having two calf crops sold in the same year. There are just some different things to think through and try to put together some budgets and look at how will this different options impact the overall profitability of the operation and, and what's my best option or best couple options based on the scenario that's presented. Aaron says testing your hay will be more important this year in order to make sure your cattle's nutrition needs are being met. He also advises to pay close attention to the animal's body condition score. It's time for markets now and we had lots to talk about with this week's analyst. Many producers may be committed to a crop contract that they won't be able to fill. We'll have some advice for those in that situation. Also, hear how what are expected to be lower yields are impacting the markets. And let's look ahead to see what may be in store for corn and soybean prices. I spoke with author and analyst Elaine Cub on Tuesday, and we started off by checking to see what conditions are like where she is. Well, uh, for my background today, I went out and I picked basically the, the scruffiest looking soybean field I could find in the neighborhood. But actually, I did that for a reason. I mean, it's a, it's a good reminder that not just here in South Dakota, but nationwide, conditions are pretty dismal for soybeans and for corn. In the latest crop progress report, uh, the soybean conditions were 53% good to excellent. That's, you know, his, compared to last year, compared to any of the previous five years, that's not what we want to see at this time of year. And there's just a lot of catching up to do, uh, just uh, heat units wise and progress wise. I mean, you look in Illinois, for instance, where they would typically want to have at least about a third of their soybean crop blooming already, only 2% are. So they are way, way behind. And just throughout the Corn Belt, everything is behind and everything has poor, poor ratings. And as we're recording this, we're waiting for the monthly crop production report. What are you looking forward to seeing here? Well, I think what farmers or producers or anyone who's bullish in this market would want to see is to see the USDA go in and change the acreage numbers that they last released in that June acreage survey. Now that June acreage survey number, 91.7 million acres, that raised a lot of eyebrows and that was just kind of releasing the numbers from a survey. But when they come in and do their monthly uh, supply and demand reports, they can make more of a judgment call. The economists can go in and, and use what they know about what the weather has been like during planting season uh, or, or what you know other reports that they have heard and it is possible that they could change the acreage numbers that go into those tables. It would be extremely, extremely rare. They usually don't have to do it and it doesn't happen very often in the past, but 1993 is a notable exception where they can use some judgment and change those acreage numbers in the supply and demand reports compared to those weird June survey numbers. And I was also reading your article about what someone should do if they've got a crop contract they need to fill, but either they didn't plant or won't have enough to fill that contract. So explain to us what that looks like from a producer's perspective and a grain buyer's perspective. Yeah, nobody is happy in that scenario, neither the producer nor the grain buyer. And it's not... It's not, uh, it's not everybody who has to deal with this problem. If you've got a producer who was maybe 30 to 50% sold before planting season, you know, they probably got enough planted that they will be able or will feel confident that they can fill any forward contracts that they have already committed to an elevator. But if you have somebody who was maybe completely skunked on their soybean acres, or they just have enough prevented plant acres, or enough yield problems that they're worried about not being able to fill the contracts, then they have to go to their elevator and try and buy out of those contracts or cancel those contracts, which usually involves a cancellation fee. And that's a pretty painful process. It's usually better if the prices are lower. So there was some urgency to do that before prices went up too much. And now that we've had a pullback, there could be a good opportunity if folks haven't already gotten out of those contracts this pullback could be an opportunity to do it. But like I mentioned, from the elevator's perspective, it's not great either because they're going, they made commitments with that grain that they thought they were going to get. And in order to, to buy it in now, they're looking at a much stronger, much, much stronger basis market. So it's costing them money too, and it's costing them lost opportunities. Anything else you want to mention as far as what options a producer might have in that scenario? Well, one 
scenario that would put you in a good mood in this in this world is if you had your own independent futures and options hedges and a lot of folks don't like to do that they don't like to open up their own brokerage account and ordinarily you don't have to any of your marketing goals can typically be done just by working with your local elevator but in a year like this one if, if you have some reason why you need to get out of a cash contract or if you need to shop around for better basis opportunities there is that independence and that flexibility that those independent hedges have for folks yeah, and on, on that topic, any tips on dealing with the, with, the, with the grain buyer as far as renegotiating that contract, having to pay less in those cancellation fees, anything there? Uh, I don't think folks have a lot of success with those renegotiations. Sometimes it will be baked into the contract. Sometimes the contract will just say something like to, to buy into how the market has changed. And because the market has changed, because it's, it's uh, the, like I mentioned, the basis has strengthened and the grain buyers are really in the catbird seat here, there's not a lot of renegotiation that's, that's possible. And I've spoken to, to grain marketing advisors all across the Midwest this year, and these cancellation fees can range anywhere from five cents to 25 cents. Uh, they can maybe, if you have a hedge gain in there, maybe you get to keep it, maybe you have to pay. There's just a lot of flexibility and it's a case by case basis. Okay. Anything else you want to say to folks who expect to be dealing with lower yield potential this year? Yeah, so the one thing that I think folks are noticing this time of year is that because we've had this consistent rain pattern all across the Corn Belt, the struggles are not done. If the crop is planted, you still need to be able to get out and get it sprayed. We're seeing more problems with uh, fungicides, uh, with insect insecticides, insect pressure. So the, the, like I said, the battle's not done. Folks still need to be able to get out into the fields with suitable field work days and get some of these things uh, done to their fields. And finally, we'd love to get your thoughts on where you see prices shaping up for corn and for soybeans. Well, I think, you know, a lot depends on how that supply and demand report turns out here this week. So things could dramatically change if those numbers change dramatically. Uh, it could be the case that we get a real boost in prices due to a change in those supply numbers. But it could also be the case that we just sort of limp along here in the corn prices with the three or 430 to 430 level. We do see new crop soybean prices above $9. And as long as we continue to see these poor condition ratings, I expect that to continue. Thanks to Elaine for being on the show. It's time for this week's trivia question. And it's about bees this week. Let's see if you get it right. Here's the question. Approximately how many bee colonies are in Nebraska? Is it 40,000, 50,000, 60,000, or is it 70,000? Make your selection and I'll have the answer after Al's forecast. We wanted to give a quick reminder for our dairy producers out there. Sign up for the new dairy margin coverage program has been going on for about a month. And you may recall the DMC is part of the 2018 Farm Bill and replaces the margin protection program for dairy. Nebraska FSA's Bobby Kurtz Wickham says resources are available for producers. The dairy margin coverage program for our dairy producers, uh, enrollment for that uh, goes now until September 20th. Uh, so we have some time yet, but we are encouraging producers to uh, learn more about that program. Uh, USDA has put out a couple of products, a, a decision support tool, um, as well as some fact sheets regarding uh, the dairy margin coverage program so producers can learn more. Um, the University of Nebraska Extension as well as Nebraska State Dairy Association and FSA are hosting a couple of educational events um, July 25th in uh, Beatrice and July 26th in Norfolk. You can get more information at fsa.usda.gov ne and we've also included some information on the Market Journal website too. Moving on, and about 30 years ago, Gary Ranke built a new farm shop on his farm in eastern North Dakota. However, he says he never quite finished it. Five years ago, Ranke moved the farming operation to southeast Nebraska, where his sons, Randy and Ryan, now farm together. In 2017, they began designing a new farm shop on land near Unadilla. The new 81 by 200 foot Morton building was completed last year, and this time, Ranke notes he wanted to do it right. In the July Nebraska Farmer, read about how the Rankies designed their new farm shop and what considerations went into the design. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. And Al, 
We've seen some warm temperatures, but also major flooding in parts of the state. What can we expect in the latest forecast? Well, Troy, you're exactly right. We did see a lot of sunshine this week, but we also seen some pretty significant thunderstorm activity, particularly in south central Nebraska, where as we got into Monday afternoon into the Tuesday morning time period, we had a warm front slowly moving through the state and basically the thunderstorms basically formed over south central Nebraska. And unfortunately, there was very little movement with them and they tended to train on top of each other until the cold front pushed them all to the east. So broad based coverage, we had a lot of reports in the six to eight inch range uh, from the Nebraska rain network and broad based coverage anywhere from about three inches to seven and a half, eight inches was common over the last seven day period for much of south central Nebraska. And of course we have the resulting flooding. Unfortunately, those systems basically petered out as they moved toward the east and much of eastern Nebraska missed out on the significant moisture. And we're actually showing deficits across east central and northeast Nebraska for the last 30 days, pushing in the half an inch up to almost an inch and three quarters up in the area just to the north of the West Point area. So there is some dryness and there has also been a very warm temperatures the last few weeks and we look to see more of that continue. So as we go to the upper air model, we'll notice that we got that big high pressure ridge in place. We do have Hurricane Barry coming on shore in Louisiana. It's going to drop a significant amount of moisture in the lower M Mississippi River Valley. As you see the low pressure system associated with that starting to move inland. But high pressure dominates much of the central United States. And even though we are showing a scattering of thunderstorm activity, that's just basically some residual left over that's the systems that move through the northern part of the state over the overnight hours. And as we go into tomorrow, that high pressure ridge is still in place, very warm conditions. Uh, the hurricane now moves up into a p basically southern portions of Mississippi, spreading very heavy precipitation. And then some weak systems moving in the, in the jet stream basically to the north of us and through Iowa. And as we get into Monday, now we start to see the ridge starting to stag just a little bit toward the south. Low pressures indicated to develop in southwestern Kansas, but the main activity will be once again in the lower Ohio River Valley as we see the, the impacts of the hurricane moving to the north and a little bit of moisture over the central Rockies. This system gets entrained into the flow as we start to zonal it out and a couple little slow, subtle waves are moving through on Tuesday with once again low pressure shown to be forming in southwestern portions of Kansas. That may give just enough lift to generate some light scattered thunderstorm activity but again most of the heavy precipitation to our east. And then on Wednesday, we start to see the ridge starting to make us move back toward the north, even though we see low pressure lined up in the, tech, in the panhandle of Nebraska and northwestern Kansas. Really, there's not a tremendous amount of flow moving toward the north, so just some isolated thunderstorm activity is being painted in southeastern and northwestern portions of Missouri, southeastern Nebraska. And then on Thursday, the ridge builds a little bit farther to the north. Even though we have low pressures lined up here with the high pressure in place, it's very likely that we will see nothing in the way of significant moisture outside of a few waves moving through South Dakota, impacting northern Nebraska. And then on Friday, the heat returns with a vengeance as the high pressure builds dominant over much of the upper Midwest. And we start to see low pressure moving into the western United States. Surface lows develop in southwestern Kansas, but but once again, with that high pressure in place in the atmosphere cap, not a lot of movement for moisture and the development of moisture. More importantly, we're starting to see the monsoon kick in, so we'll start to watch this the next few weeks to see if that moisture starts to entrain itself up into the western high plains. 8 to 14 day forecast keeps the heat in place at least for the next two weeks, and in terms of precipitation, much drier forecast for the western corn belt. Thanks, Al. Back to trivia now, and this week we asked about how many bee colonies are in Nebraska? Well, since it's a question about bees, then the answer has to be choice B, right? 50,000 is the correct answer. As the summer months ramp up, so do the number of pest problems for producers. Among them, the Japanese beetle and thistle caterpillar. That's what Market Journal's Bill Dodd has his eye on this week. Bill, what have you got for us today? Thanks, Troy. We've hit the point in the season where pest control becomes critical for corn and soy producers. Now one thing producers have noticed this year is an insurgence of the Japanese beetle. And that's not to be confused with the sand shaver. Now these beetles are identifiable by the metallic green head and tufts of white hair around their bodies. And when feeding, they tend to feed in clusters due to the lure of the female sex hormone and chemicals emitted from damaged plants. These pests typically contribute to defoliation of soybeans. As with other species of insect, they tend to strip the leaves down to the veins usually in the upper canopy, making the damage very visible. Similarly to the corn rootworm beetles, Japanese beetles will go after the green tissue on corn leaves, but do prefer the silks once they're accessible, and this could hinder pollination. Nebraska Extension entomologist Dr. Bob Wright says among these problems is the fact that the species seems to be staking more claims further west into Nebraska. 
easy to tell. The big issue we're seeing is that they're expanding their range in Nebraska. For a long time, they were just in Lincoln and Omaha in the last several years. They've been moving out into the agricultural areas of the state, and now we can find some populations as far west as uh, at least the halfway through the state now. Not not uniformly, but they're, we're starting to see the new, new areas each year, so it's something people should watch for. If they haven't had them before, they might have them this year. I guess the sort of the theme is there's a lot of insects that feed on soybean leaves and we look at the management of them similarly regardless of what species it is. And so in some ways Japanese beetle is just another defoliating insect as well as all these caterpillars we've had. So in terms of the management in some ways or at least the treatment decision is similar because we're just talking about defoliation levels mostly. Now another thing producers have asked Dr. Wright about is the influx of painted lady butterflies in the state this year. The species isn't new to Nebraska by any means, but there certainly seem to be quite a few more than usual this year as they make their way north. The painted lady butterflies pupate from the thistle caterpillar and are identifiable by their brown-black bodies and yellow stripe down the length of the caterpillar. This is accompanied by spiky hairs along with the body and will reach about 1.5 inches at maturity. These caterpillars will normally feed on thistles, sunflowers, and other similar plants. However, they have been a problem in Nebraska soybeans, and Dr. Wright explains this year was the perfect storm for the species to thrive and migrate through the Cornhusker State. We had other, other moths and butterflies that build up to the south of us, so we had a variety of caterpillars, uh, soybean loopers, uh, yellow striped army worms, true army worms, and all these are insects that don't overwinter in Nebraska, but uh, migrate up in the spring uh, if the weather conditions are appropriate. So. It's sort of unusual that we've had so many of these caterpillars uh, this time of year, but it was basically due to the, the weather conditions to the south of us and also the winds that allowed them to come up here. So uh, the other question I've gotten is how long are the painted ladies going to stay around? And typically they do uh, start moving further north later in the summer. Uh, probably depends on the right weather conditions so they get a a good strong breeze out of the south, they'll probably start moving north. So they, they won't be around here in high numbers all summer, but continue to check your soybean fields. They may reinfest fields uh, from the butterflies that are emerging now, or they may continue to move further north. With one pest bulking up its numbers and another pest moving aggressively into the state, these are two canopy feeders that producers should be seeking out and exterminating. But how you treat for these pests greatly depends on the severity of defoliation caused by them. Well, the main issue with both Japanese beetles and the caterpillars we've seen is to assess the level of leaf loss or defoliation. And if we have more than 30% defoliation while the soybean is in the vegetative stage, that's a level to treat. Once we start having flowering and they're in the reproductive stage, we want to lower that to 20% because the soybean is more sensitive to leaf loss when it's trying to produce pods. When it's, as opposed to earlier when it's just uh, growing leaves. So we have, I know we have a lot of different planting dates of soybeans this year, so different fields are in different stages. Some are still vegetative, some are starting to, to go into reproductive stage. So that's one thing to look for is what stage is the soybeans you're looking at and that'll determine what defoliation level you should be looking for. A big thing to look for, particularly with Japanese beetles and some of these caterpillars, is they tend to feed in the upper canopy and when you're estimating defoliation, you want to try to average it over the whole plant, and that's sort of difficult because that, that damage at the top of the plant really sort of jumps in your face, but you have to take a step back and think about, okay, over the whole plant, what's the percent leaf, leaf loss? Uh, and in, in our CropWatch newsletter, we've uh, suggested a, a process to try to train yourself to look at the defoliation level. The other issue is when people who don't have experience estimate defoliation, you tend to overestimate defoliation. And we have some photographs on crop watch that show known levels of defoliation of leaflets and you can compare uh, leaflets from the field with some of these photos and sort of train yourself so you, you're more accurate. And that's what we have our guidelines are based on to try to uh, avoid yield reduction but there's a certain level of defoliation that has no effect on yield. And so you don't want to spray at that point. Uh, you want to wait until there's enough to cause economic damage where you get a return on your investment of the insecticide. 
Now, if you'd like to learn more about specific information on foliar insecticides that are most effective against these pests, you can find the section of registered insecticides for soybeans in the Nebraska Extension Guide for Weed, Disease, and Insect Management in Nebraska at cropwatch.unl.edu. And Troy, that's what I've got my eye on this week. We'll send it back to you. Thanks, Bill. For our final story today, anyone interested in pork production is invited to the upcoming Northeast Nebraska Swine Summit on July 17th. There are going to be discussions on how diversifying your farm with a swine facility could bring in some extra money. And you'll also hear some market updates as it relates to the pork industry, tips for building a hog barn, swine nutrient management, and a lot more too. They're kind of twofold. 50% uh, of the, the time is going to be kind of geared towards new producers, people that are either just getting into pork production or perhaps row crop producers that are considering opportunities in pork production. And then we'll obviously have some material, some speakers that are focused more on those existing producers. We really just want to highlight some of the advancements as far as technology in modern pork production, as well as highlight how pork production can add value to an existing row crop operation. A lot of the attendees that have already RSVP'd are actually row crop producers that are considering swine con confinement facilities. We've got three or four large integrators that have a, a high demand for contract producers here in the state, and so we really want to take an opportunity to highlight some of those um, contracts and some of those opportunities to producers here in Nebraska. There will also be updates on African swine fever, a disease causing major disruptions in the Chinese hog markets, and whose impacts are being monitored closely here by the USDA. I think there's an obvious fear, and, and rightfully so, um, as in any industry, biosecurity is going to be very huge as far as that. But I think there also is some opportunities for growth. If we can, if we can uh, maintain a biosecure herd here in the United States, I think there's opportunities for growth in the swine industry here as other countries struggle uh, more greatly with that issue. Once more, the Northeast Nebraska Swine Summit will take place on July 17th in Norfolk at Northeast Community College at the Lifelong Learning Center. There's more information on the screen, and we've got more on the Market Journal website. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. Next week, Doug Simon will be here to help us break down the markets. We'll offer some tips to keep your cattle cool and eating in rising temperatures and hear about some new things happening at the Haskell Ag Lab. All that and more. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.